G'day, everybody. Um, I'm Richard Glover from ABC Radio Sydney, and I'm a great dog lover, but I am absolutely determined to be a fair judge of this debate. We have the affirmative team and, of course, the horrible team. I'll introduce you to them in a second. Uh, welcome, of course, to the Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival 2021. Uh, great to be back in a room with other crime lovers uh, and also welcoming those people who are joining us on Zoom uh, from their local library or uh, from home courtesy of their local library. We acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional owners of this land and pay respect to the elders past present and emerging. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the Metcalfe Auditorium today. Of course, please mute your mobile phones. Don't record the session. If you're taking photos, please turn off your flash and feel free to share on social media at Bad Crime Sydney, hashtag, hashtag Bad Crime Sydney, uh, hashtag the horrible team, <laughs> hashtag the nice They're team, whatever you like. Um, let me introduce the speakers. We have Sue Turnbull here. Sue is Senior Professor of Communications and Media at the University of Wollongong, has been reviewing crime fiction for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age for over 20 years. She's also judged the Ned Kelly Awards, the David Awards, is ambassadors for, as an ambassador for Sisters in Crime Australia. And her academic publications include TV, crime, drama, and media audience, audiences. And Professor Turnbull is also chair of this festival. Uh, Solari uh, Gentle won the 2019 Ned Kelly Award for the best crime fiction for her Crossing the Lines. She's also author of the Roland Sinclair mystery set in 1930s Australia, the first of which was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers Prize Best First Book, while her Decline in Profits won the Davitt Award for Best Adult Crime Fiction. On the horrible team, <laughs> Robert Gott, who we heard sighing earlier. It's because he doesn't like being hated, but secretly, secretly we know he does. <laughs> Robert is the creator of the newspaper cartoon, The Adventures of Naked Man. He's also author of the uh, William Power series of crime caper novels set in 1940s Australia. So we've got the 30s covered and the 40s, uh, comprising Good Murder, A Thing of Blood, Amongst the Dead and The Serpent Sting. And of the Murders series comprising The Holiday Murders, The Port Ferry Murders, The Autumn Murders, and the Orchard Murders. And of course, sitting next to Robert is Jean Kitson, one of Australia's best known writers and performers and star of shows from the big gig to talking about your generation. And of course, the pinnacle of her career, appearing on Thank God It's Friday hey. with me. Uh, Jean's recent books include You're Still Hot to Me, a fact-filled conversation starter about menopause and her book about aging. We need to talk about, about mum and dad. If you're feeling warm, this afternoon, it's probably not the air conditioning system. It's probably Gene. <laughs> so let's get into it and introduce the first speaker, and it is Professor Sue Turnbull. Sue. I'd like to begin with an apology. To our cat, Miss Bryn, who would, of course, prefer the dog to die and would probably kill him herself if he would just come close enough for her to get her paws around his throat. Sadly, we live with the equivalent of the Berlin Wall in our house. While the dog is banished to the Spartan East, the cat lives it up in the decadent West. Actually, it's more of an upstairs downstairs scenario, but you get my drift. And I feel bad about that, which is one of the reasons that the dog must not die, especially in crime fiction. So let's be quite clear about this from the start. Crime writers, many of you who are present, as my esteemed colleague Solari Gentle will forcibly and convincingly argue, you kill the dog at your peril, lest your readers abandon you on page five. Which did indeed happen when I picked up a crime novel by American crime writer Carol O'Connell, in which the old man's dog was killed. I won't say how, or I'll start weeping again, and I don't want to put anyone through that, especially our chair, Richard, who I know has wept inconsolably for the death of the dog Argus in Homer's Odyssey. Fictional dogs are as real to us readers as real dogs. There is simply no distinction. And here's the thing, dogs are human too. They smile, they frown, they talk, they write letters. 
As our esteemed referee has proved with the publication of his Kelpie Clancy's memoirs, Love Clancy, A Dog's Letters Home. I am assuming, of course, Richard, that royalties all go to Clancy. Yes. <laughs> And dogs can solve crimes, not just because they always know who the bad guy really is, like Timmy in The Famous Five, another totally real dog who would woof and growl at the first hint of a dubious type, usually a gypsy looking person. In fact, dogs make great investigators, as Australian crime writer Louise L.A. Larkin has proved once again in her latest thriller, the Bone Ranger, starring Monty, the dog detective. You're probably not aware of this, but there are a large number of dog detectives out there in crime fiction, and I shall name but a few, including Sherlock Bones, Gertrude the Dog Detective, and Detective McGruff. There are even dog detectives in the noir genre, as the enticingly entitled thriller K9 Blues might suggest. Little do people know that so many great crime novels were originally all about dogs. Take Raymond Chandler's The Maltese Falcon, which was originally entitled The Maltese Shih Tzu Cross. <laughs> or Stieg Larsson's original conception for his Swedish Millennium series, The Girl with the Daxon Tattoo. <laughs> with the original title, Men Who Hate Dogs, of course. Not forgetting John le Carre's foray into the canine Cold War spy thriller, Tinker, Taylor, Soldier, Spot. <laughs> the fact that dogs can solve crimes and talk should come as no surprise to anyone here, since one of the first lessons we learn in childhood is that all animals can talk. If you're any in doubt about this, ask a four-year-old about Bluey, the blue healer puppy and her family, who are now a global Australian animation success story. For those of us who are a bit older, we probably discovered this essential truth early in our literary careers. First, there was Winnie the Pooh, in which a dim bear, a nervous piglet, a depressed donkey, and an irrepressible tiger all have speaking parts. <laughs> Or take the wind in the willows, in which a busy rat, a friendly mole, and an aging bachelor badger all converse eloquently, while Toad is the prototypical Trumpian narcissist. <laughs> Nor should we forget Watership Down, which was the Game of Thrones blockbuster of its day, only starring rabbits, not dragons. I think maybe a rabbit did die in Watership Down, but I seem to remember he was old, and I handled that one quite well. There may have also been some bad rabbits in there too, whatever. What I don't remember is being traumatized and inconsolable, which was what happened when I read Black Beauty, in which, spoiler alert, a horse died. That book had to be taken away from a devastated eight-year-old me and hidden, and I'm still upset. As it is these days, I approach any crime novel featuring an animal, but especially a dog, with great caution and a compelling question, do I trust the author? When Rene Ballard decides to adopt a dog in Michael Connolly's latest police procedural, The Dark Hours, I kind of trusted Michael not to do anything dire, and he doesn't. But when I picked up The Long Game, a debut Australian police procedural by Simon Rowell, in which Detective Sergeant Zoe Mayer is accompanied on her murder investigation on the Mornington Peninsula by Harry, her Victorian police service dog, I wasn't so sure. In fact, I had to have a bit of a peek at the ending to make sure Harry was still there. Fortunately, the last line read, and this isn't a spoiler alert so much as a reassurance, I'll call you tomorrow, taking Harry to the beach. At which point I took a deep cleansing breath and returned to page one. But, and here's the thing, underpinning all this anxiety about killing animals in crime fiction or in any other context is the guilt I feel about being a failed vegetarian. This is a moral issue for me. I've tried to atone. Indeed, I've spent the whole, this whole weekend avoiding animal flesh in preparation for this debate. 
and the inevitable guilt trip that will follow. Even seafood isn't really safe. After watching Finding Nemo or My Octopus Teacher, I cried at the end of that one too. All of us know eating people is wrong. You can go to jail for that. <laughs> and since animals are people too, we shouldn't eat them either. They don't like it. Take it from me, saving the dog in crime fiction may well be the last moral refuge of the failed vegetarian. So kill who you like in crime fiction, even the central protagonist, if you must. I can bear that. But whatever you do, don't kill the dog at the risk of killing my desire to read on. <laughs> A warning for those who would like to be reviewed in the Herald or the or the uh, or the Age. She is she is right about Bluey. We've been playing on the ABC a promo for the new um, series of Bluey, and I got an anguished call from a father. We're playing it on high rotation. This little promo, We're playing it every half hour, and his father rang me up full of anguish, and he said, "Look, I understand the ABC needs to pr promote these things, but I've got a two and a half year old in the back seat, and every time you play that blasted thing, he expects the series to emerge in the car." <laughs> I know you have to advertise it, but can't you just spell it out? A new series of B L U. <laughs> I thought it was a pretty fair request. Um, to uh, put the other side of this, to tell us why the novelist should kill the dog, please welcome Robert Gott. You may regret that applause. <clears throat> Um, Enid, Enid Blyton used to play, used to play tennis in the nude. I'll just repeat that. Enid Blyton used to play tennis in the nude. Now, this is a fact that has nothing to do with this debate, but it's something you should know because it's important to leave an event like this with more knowledge than you came with. And it might be the only worthwhile piece of information you hear. Now, I know what I'm about to say will cause half of you, maybe more than half of you, to despise me, but I'm from Melbourne <laughs> and nothing would give me greater pleasure than to be despised in Sydney. <laughs> and anyway, this isn't fair because you don't actually know me and I can give you much better reasons to despise me than the one I'm about to provide. I hate dogs. <laughs> there, I've said it. I hate dogs. They smell and they shit everywhere. Oh, no, wait, that's children. <laughs> um, hang on. Well, I hate children too. But let's not get off topic this early. There's plenty of time to go off topic later. So back to dogs. Now, I have friends who tell me with a sense of wonder in their voices that their dog is so intelligent it can open the fridge door. Now, to me, this seems like a pretty low bar. <laughs> it isn't quite the same as writing Principia Mathematica or on the origin of species. And these same friends spend half their lives literally, literally, <laughs> pulling plastic bags out of this canine Einstein's ass because this genius eats plastic bags. And perhaps for you who love dogs, the most remarkable thing about this story is that I have friends. <laughs> we all have our favourite dogs in fiction. There's Jip. In great, expectation, who, in great Expectations, who is only marginally less cloying and annoying than its mistress. There's Buck in Jack London's Call of the Wild, who goes from pampered pet to ripping out a man's throat, which is the secret ambition of every dog. <laughs> <laughs> There's Toto in The Wizard of Oz, who disappointingly survives that tornado. There's Snowy, in the adventures of Tintin, his name is not Snowy. 
real name is Milu. There's Lassie. Lassie was played in every single film by a male dog. There's reason for cancellation right there. So many dogs, so many lies. Jean and I won't lie to you. That is our promise. That is our pledge to you. We will leave the lies, the obfuscation, the ears, the showy, the ears, the sad smoke screen of the ears to our opposition. But let me tell you about my favorite dog in fiction because I do have one. It doesn't have a name and it makes a very brief appearance in Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights before Heathcliff hangs it from its neck on a gatepost to appall his new wife, Isabella. And let me read the moving passage where this is described. <laughs> this is Heathcliff speaking. His wife's name is Isabella. It's on their wedding day. He says, Isabella cannot accuse me of showing any deceitful softness. The first thing she saw me do on coming out of the Grange was to hang up her little dog. And when she pleaded for it, the first words I uttered were a wish that I had the hanging of every being belonging to her. Now, compare this robust and bracing piece of prose with the soggy sentimentality being peddled by our opponents. Now let's go full noir here and call these two what they are. They're frails. <laughs> now there is a website designed to help our frails with choosing books that they can cope with. <laughs> And that website is called doesthedogdie.com. It's a real website. You can Google it surreptitiously so you know that one side in this debate can be relied on to be telling you the truth. The website sets out all of the triggers which might upset people who have a very fragile grasp on the meaning of fiction and who confuse novels with reality. Now, let me share with you some of the triggers that might be pulled when our frails pick up a book. The website asks a series of questions which they run over any chosen novel. So here we go. First off, is there a dead animal? Does a dog die? Are there bugs? Is there finger or toe mutilation? Is there copaganda? I had to look this one up. I'd never heard of this. Copaganda is the celebratory portrayal of the police. <laughs> Big trigger. Is there a shower scene? Is there shaving? Are there fat jokes? Is there genital trauma? Are there clowns? Now, when I read these, I just think, well, that's just Tuesday night at my place. <laughs> and just for anybody who hasn't read Wuthering Heights, according to doesthedogdie.com, there are several dead dogs, but there are no fat jokes and there are no clowns. But at one point, however, Heathcliff does shave, just so you know. Now, I've made this point already. I'll hurry through it again, but it bears repeating. Dogs in fiction are not real. But let me tell you about something that is real. I was on a flight in America recently, and Solari can reluctantly back me up because she was on that same flight. And a person came on that flight with an emotional support dog. This is actually a thing. And people have turned up at airports with an assortment of creatures on which they allegedly depend. There was a well-known controversy of the emotional support peacock, which was denied a seat on a plane, but the emotional support turkey was allowed. It was wearing a nappy. The emotional support hamster was denied because there's some rule about rodents on planes and the owner got so emotional that he flushed it down the aircraft <laughs> toilet. The emotional support miniature horse was also allowed, and that's worth Googling. Now, mostly though, it's dogs. I know I'm circling away from books here, but stay with me. My point is about anthropomorphizing. If you're terrified of flying, how do you think the dog feels? <laughs> dogs famously are not creatures associated with flight. Those are legs. They are not wings. 
if they could somehow acquire agency, they would sue their human for abuse. So when a person gets on a plane with their dog, what they're saying is, hi, I'm emotionally unstable. <laughs> Can I sit next to you for 14 hours? But how does this apply to fiction and the phony need to always spare the dog? Clearly, we are supposed to buy the idea that every time a dog appears on the page, it acquires for the reader the dubious status of an emotional support animal to help the reader through the book. This suggests a dispiriting epidemic of neediness in the community. Now, I don't want to be that person who says toughen up people, but seriously, toughen up people. <laughs> I have one final observation. Everybody knows To Kill a Mockingbird and everybody loves Atticus Finch. Well, cover your ears. Trigger warning because in To Kill a Mockingbird, saintly Atticus Finch takes a gun and he shoots a dog dead. Yes. <laughs> yes. Rabid. Rabid schmabbed. Let's not quibble. Let's not quibble about adjectives. <laughs> there is a dog and Atticus Finch shoots it. And you, Solari Gentle, you named one of your sons after that man. <laughs> a known dog killer. What a, what a brutal attack on a fellow panellist. Thank God Solari has brought her emotional support peacock today and it'll now be brought in. <laughs> she is the next speaker. Are the ears staying on? Uh, yes. Please, please welcome her and her ears. So... Ladies and gentlemen, writers and readers, I think it's important at this stage to consider Robert Gott's absurd, outrageous, whiny contentions in light of his books. My friend Bob has had an illustrious career which stretches back for many decades. His name is established as a writer of crime and as a crime writer, he has a track record of significant literary violence. Take Good Murder, his first book. A slain girl is left to decompose in the town's water supply, gradually being ingested by her friends and her family and the neighbors. The Holiday Murders, opens with a corpse sitting upright in a chair with a severed body in its lap. That same book also has a man being nailed to the floor. All of Bob's work contains various scenes of mutilation and torture, which he throws onto the page with the greatest of glee. His most recent offering begins with a man holding the body of a pulpy baby in his arms. I see you falling silent and recoiling in horror, <laughs> as well you should. <laughs> Clearly, Bob is not well. <laughs> this is not a man who is predisposed to mercy or compassion or even good taste. <laughs> but here's the rub. Despite all the fictional atrocities committed by Robert Gott, he has not once killed a dog. <laughs> Why, you ask? Why does a man who is so intent on murder so most foul, who professes, as we have heard here, uh, a uh, desire to kill not just a dog, but every dog, 
and their attached humans. Why does he refuse to do so in his own novels? The answer is quite simple, really. Robert wants people to read his books. <laughs> he quite likes being a writer. And he knows that killing the dog will cause readers to stop, close the book, and never read him again. Robert may be a little unhinged, but he's smart enough to know crime writers can kill anyone but the dog. He spoke to you of emotional support animals. In fact, he had a, a great long list of complaints, but about among them uh, prominently was the emotional support animal. Now, whilst I can attest, I was there on the plane when the emotion, emotional support animal was brought on uh, to support its human through the flight. And I agree that that might be a little absurd. Surely, surely that is an argument for killing the human attached <laughs> rather than the dog. The dog didn't choose to drag the human on a flight. <laughs> it was the other way around. Now, look, there, there are many reasons, social and psychological, why dogs hold an unassailable position in literature. Uh, but there's only one that really matters. Killing the dog will turn readers against you and it won't matter what you've written afterwards. You will have lost them forever. The fact is that when a human character is killed, the reader blames the book's villain. When the dog is killed in a novel, the reader blames the author. And they turn against you forever. Your serial killing, corpse eating, misogynistic, racist, snobby, smelly villain will not be loathed nearly so much as you are. You will have broken a covenant which promises the reader of crime fiction that if they allow you to kill whoever you want in order to keep them on the edge of their seats, you will leave the dog alone. If you break that covenant, then you will always be the writer who betrayed them. You will have gone to a dark, soulless place that even the likes of Robert Gott will not go. I see some of you looking a little perturbed. You think I'm being unfair, countering Robert's arguments with Robert himself. <laughs> After all, I hear you say he didn't have a choice about what side of the argument he was given. Not so, my friends. Prior to the team sides being allocated, Robert said to me, and I quote, Solari, he said, I will argue for killing the dog whichever side I'm on. <laughs> And when indeed he was given that side, because what else could we do? He said, goody, oh, splendid. Let's kill all the dogs. <laughs> Why? Why is this man like this? Because Robert Gott likes killing sacred cows, which is fine as long as it's a cow and not the bloody dog. <laughs> so let's talk about sacred cows. They exist for a reason. Sometimes they're protected for spiritual or traditional reasons. Um, that kind of protection may, I admit, lose its potency. At, but at other times, the reason is practical. Like, if you kill the dog, readers will hate you. They will stop buying your books. Your house will be repossessed and you will die broken and lonely and possibly, in the case of Roberts, naked. Those kind of reasons are enduring. It occurs to me, however, that Robert may have another reason for telling you that the, the dog is fair game. It may indeed be purely self-interest, a campaign of misinformation designed by a master propagandist to facilitate his plans for sales domination. Consider this. Should the upcoming crop of crime writers, fresh-faced and eager and believing, 
decide on Bob's advice, and he does give this advice at workshops, kill the dog, he says, if they decide to challenge conventions and disregard the experience of the old guard, uh, well, there'll be less competition, really, I suppose, for those of us who, like Robert himself, have the good sense not to kill the dog. Yeah, I think that must be it. The cranky old man of literature. The cr <laughs> Is, is trying to take out the new bloods in a manner that is so cold and calculating and devious that it could be a crime novel in itself. He's urging the competition to commit the gravest folly, an act which will not only sink the book in which it occurs, but this, uh, make sure that the author is thereafter regarded with suspicion and hostility by the reading public. Who can, of course, forget the much anticipated debut novel of Bruce Osmond? You're looking blank. You haven't heard of him? Well, that's because he followed Bob's advice and killed the dog. <laughs> this is the path on which this man seeks to lead the innocent, unsuspecting debutante writers of crime fiction. Luckily, Sue and I are sworn to protect author kind from the devious machinations of Dr. Gott. <laughs> Authors have a position of privilege, ladies and gentlemen. Readers entrust their imaginations and their hearts to us every time they pick up one of our novels. They're asked to move, to thrill, to terrify and inspire. But to quote Spider-Man's wise uncle, with great power comes great responsibility. The cavalier kill you and the dog you came in with attitude of our colleagues opposite puts the entire genre at risk. Perhaps there are readers out there who want to read about dogs being tortured and killed, but they are not fans of crime fiction. Our fans know that whatever twist we may introduce whatever shock may lurk in the reveal, however many may need to die, the dog will be safe. And so let me finish with a warning, nay, uh, a plea to all you writers out there who are determined to make your name by defying an old taboo, who feel the need to plant your flag on the genre with a murder that will reduce the most hardened reader to tears. If you must slaughter an animal, if it's vital to your oh-so-edgy plot, your potentially award-winning novel, to kill the family pet for the sake of all that is decent and good and wise, take the cat. <laughs> Brutal summary of uh, Robert's work, wasn't it? If you, if you want to know more about Robert's work, you can check out the website hoistonhisownpetard.com. <laughs> anyway. Please welcome Jane Kitson. Thank you, everyone. Hello. Welcome to this, uh, this sad debate, really. And after hearing Solari and her twisted manipulation of you all, I am really disheartened because I don't think you know readers at all very well. You're trying to manipulate young writers by saying that you know what readers want, but I think after my argument, you will actually realise that all readers don't think the same as you and can you hear in the just the general topics that have been said about the dog it was a mercy killing did the dog have a say in it no I don't I think you can you can't have kill your dog on one hand and when it's mercy and don't kill it on the other but all will be clear my esteemed colleague Robert which I, who I greatly admire. And I'm sure your next book will contain a dead dog. If you have any moral fiber at all, you will start with a dead dog. It's called a dead dog. 
exactly. Now, my esteemed colleague mentioned Enid Blyton playing tennis in the nude, not as a gratuitous piece of gossip or to soften you up or titillate you or to even hint at his humanity, but, <laughs> but to highlight the fact that in literature, for a woman writer to be taken seriously, she had to play tennis at the very least <laughs> and possibly golf. Agatha Christie designed a golf course, although as a woman, she was probably banned from playing on it. It is even worse for female characters in fiction. One American scriptwriter said recently that the principal role for women in movies and television series is to be found dead. That's the truth. For example, while in lockdown, many of us watched the intensely popular series Ozark, but not me, not me. In the first few scenes, a woman is shot dead through the door of the ladies. She has nothing to do with the story. She does not advance the plot. Her cruel death is meant to show that one character is not to be trifled with in a way that saves time. In her second appearance, she is in the background being packed into a barrel. This is meant to show that we are watching an edgy comedy. What's, why wasn't her part allocated to a dog? A friendly tail wagging dog would have triggered a pleasing response in an audience and shooting the dog with her nose in her good o's would have made everyone hate the villain even more while still saving time. <laughs> so should the die dog die? Well, if it means a woman doesn't die, yes, <laughs> definitely. Because in my house, if a woman is gratuitous, gratuitously killed in the first five minutes, or even killed for a reason, if a button shiny with use is pressed, we won't watch it and we won't read it on principle. And this is where killing the dog is a very strong alternative. In the movie John Wick, the writers aim for the double. John Wick is wound up like a clockwork soldier and let loose because a bad person kills his dog, which was left to him by his wife, who was also killed by a bad person and is mentioned simply to press the woman killed button and who doesn't even appear on screen. This is considered enough to warrant an hour and a half of John Wick shooting minions. No one even says your wife would not have wanted all these pointless shootings. No one even says this won't bring your dog back, you know. <laughs> Let me also refresh your memories about the Women in Refrigerators website set up by a feminist comic book fans, feminist comic book fans, to challenge the comic book trope, whereby female characters are afflicted by injury, killed or depowered to stimulate protective traits and as a plot device to move a male character's story arc forward. But this happens to women in comics, but not the dogs. Rex the Wonder Dog, Streak the Wonder Dog, Crypto, the super dog, Ace, the bat hound, they all solve crimes, save the world, earn themselves some pig's ear treats and dodge bullets. They don't get killed. They don't even get ticks. <laughs> and they are absolutely set up to be killed because they're super... Uh, their superpower owners have secret identities. Dogs don't do secret identities. Superman's dog Crypto should be humping Clark Kent's leg and be vaporized before he gives the secret away. To be fair, dogs have been given many roles, some leading roles and even death scenes in popular fiction for hundreds of years. When a wit's already been mentioned, when Odysseus returns from his odyssey, after 20 years, only his faithful dog Argos recognizes him. 
and Argos promptly drops dead because he is 140 years old in people years and he doesn't have to mope around waiting anymore. And you are all familiar with the Hound of the Baskervilles who is killed off, but only after a major role as a serial killer. More problematic is the dog that didn't bark in the nighttime, meaning Sherlock Holmes deduces that the dog knows the suspect and is a sucker for a fistful of liver treats. Well, duh, this really is a no shit Sherlock moment. <laughs> a clue that stands out like dog's balls. This plot twist happens in the story Silver Blaze, which really should be about a page and a half long. Do you own the dog? Yes. Did the dog bark? No. Officer arrested the dog's owner right there. So the dog dies in one story because he is a bad dog. And the dog lives in another story because he is a good dog. This could raise a familiar nature versus nurture question. Was he born a good boy or did he become a good boy? but it doesn't, it should. As my colleague has said, our opponents are mired in soggy sentiment. If you want to press the sympathy button, kill off the cavoodle, certainly, <laughs> of course. But what about the brutalized guard dogs, the aggressive crocodile jawed fight dogs, the police dogs of dictatorships? Were they always slavering minions? Were they once puppies? Do they have a backstory? Well, very occasionally, actually, they do. But only if their name is on the marquee. And this happens in the Australian classic Dusty about a dog half Kelpie and half Dingo, who rounds up livestock by day and kills them by night, <laughs> like an Aussie werewolf. And this story is only going to go one way. Then there is a more problematic American classic novel and movie, Old Yeller. This pooch is a pleasing product of dutiful and protective parents and fiercely loyal to its owners until it saves the young owners from a rabid wolf and gets bitten and gets rabies and gets shot. But according to our opposition here, that's okay. As I said, the dog didn't really have a say in that. Maybe he would have lived with rabies. Happy to live with rabies for a while longer. <laughs> My husband actually saw the movie at a very tender age on a naval base. And afterwards, when the sailors were lining up to march back to the barracks, they all had tears rolling down their cheeks because they were country boys gone down to the sea and they had all had an old yellow and a dusty back home. And these stories were emotional rides. And most importantly, no woman entered stage left and got stretched off stage right. Leading the pack of the dogs who most deserve to die, feature in two scathing no novels about the horrors of Bolshevism. In American Animal Farm, they are, you will remember the litter of pups, removed from their mother and raised in the attic to be loyal only to the lead pig and unleashed as slavering, teeth-bearing killers on the other animals to keep them in bondage. They are the NKVD, they are the KGB, they are the ancestors of Putin and worse. And the real horror dog show is titled The Heart of the Dog by Michael Bulgakov. And his dog, Sharikov, is an abandoned stray taken home by a kindly professor. <laughs> and restored to health. And then the professor, she performs a little operation on him in which she adds human pituitary glands to Sharak's brain and human testicles to Sharak's reproductive zone. And yes, he becomes Frankenstein's monster and Scooby-Doo's evil twin and Henry Higgins' social experiment all at once. And as you can see, I think our opposition has already been doing a little <laughs> DNA, <laughs> DNA manipulation right here. 
And Bulgakov's point was that the Bolshevik plan to alter humanity was wicked and unnatural and would get your slippers ripped to shreds. <laughs> His hybrid humanoid hound is a hideous blend of the worst of both species. And he eventually denounces the professor to the secret police. And this novel was banned for 60 years, which gave everyone time to read it in Samizat form. And it became a film and an opera, and then another film and an opera. See, readers <laughs> loved it. There is no sentimental gushing over dogs in this story. Lassie would have been lunch. And the readers and the viewers and the opera buffs can only breathe out when the mongrel is lobotomized and neutered. Hooray. So in your next book, or movie, by all means, kill the dogs, unless they are making themselves useful. You know they are asking for it. <laughs> Ew. You shouldn't have done that, Sue. I mean, I know the University of Wollongong is a center of excellence, but I think that those dog experiments, they... <laughs> They really should. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to give a right of reply to both sides. Just one right of reply. So the first speaker is going to speak for three minutes, rebut themselves, rebut everything that's happened and see if they can win you over. And then we will take a vote on the topic. So, Sue, you do the first rebuttal. You've got three minutes and I'm going to keep the clock off. I may not even need that. <laughs> Thank you, Jean, for that overblown overwrought and over time expose of dogs <laughs> across, I don't know, opera, fiction, theater, whatever. We're talking about crime fiction here and crime readers. And where do crime readers read their crime fiction? Most usually in bed before they go to sleep. And the last thing they want is to actually be haunted by the death of a dog just before they go to sleep. It produces nightmares. It's just not a happy thing. If you, if you doubt my words, think of Michael Robotham's fifth book, Bleed For Me, in which the dog is, um, is killed, um, indeed slaughtered horribly, um, in chapter 26. And if you go to Michael Robotham killed the dog, you will discover that there are readers saying, avoid chapter 26, avoid chapter 26, don't read Michael Robotham again. It is, he really put people off. It was quite a worry. So there was Solari. And what did we also get? Oh, okay, this is, this is what I took away from this. I learned that Enid Blyton played tennis in the nude. I learned that Agatha Christie designed a golf course. I learned that Heathcliff was not a nice person. And I learned that Robert Gott is not a well man. <laughs> not a well man, please. <laughs> Look, I started listening to Sue Turnbull initially, and then, I don't know, my mind started to wander, and uh, I started thinking, why is Clive Palmer such an asshole? <laughs> and so I was thinking about that for a while and turning that over in my mind, and then Sue sat down. <laughs> so I don't know, I, I, I missed what she was saying. Then Solari stood up and I tried to re refocus and concentrate. <sighs> Again, I am very old. It's true, I am very old. I tried to refocus and I was aware that there was someone up here at the microphone, but it was like that annoying barking of the dog next door. And if you tell me that you don't want to shoot that dog, you are lying. So anyway, I knew there was something about dogs going on. And then I thought, if you took the IQ of every anti-vaxxer in the country, and added it up, would it equal the IQ of a single golden retriever? <laughs> and I'm talking about a specific golden retriever. I'm talking about the golden retriever that eats plastic bags, <laughs> that golden retriever. And then oh, Solari sat down. But 
If I may just make one correction to what Solari said about my books, not about me, I'm very happy with what she said about me, <laughs> but just a corrective. She mendaciously led you to believe that I don't have any dogs who die in my books. And that is true, I don't. But what she didn't tell you is that there are no dogs in my books. And the reason there are no dogs in my books is because they're all dead before they arrive. <laughs> oh, now we come to the adjudication. And I think we've got to go back to Argos, don't we? Because this is the oldest dog in human literature. And is, uh, do you know the scene that Gene mentioned? So Homer has been away on his odyssey for years and years, and he comes back and, 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 and the, Odysseus has, and the traitors have taken over his hometown and uh, are doing all sorts. Of, so he's got to dress in disguise and go in and see what's happening to, with all these disloyal people. And so when he walks up, he's in disguise and he's on this mullock heap. Homer says, outside the, pa the, the palace gates, there's this old flea-bitten dog. Think of Robert, possibly. Um, <laughs> nearing the end of life. Um, and, um, and of course, as, as the dog sees Odysseus, his sort of ears go up and he struggles to his, his, uh, his feet and the, and the tail wags. But Odysseus is in disguise and so cannot acknowledge the dog. Oh because to acknowledge the dog would to be give away the disguise. So as Homer has it, he walks up the palace step with just this one tear snaking down his cheek. And at that point, the dog dies. At that point, the dog dies. And the dog dies, you know, there are various views about what, what, why he dies. I think he dies because his ma he, is, he is replete in the knowledge that his master is home. And so his task in life is done. I think that's why, that's, that's, that's right. <laughs> He had the Iliad. He had the Iliad. So, so this is not this is this is not to prejudge the debate, of course, because you could say you could say that the that the the story of Argos is such a beautiful story, um, and 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 written eight you know uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of of years ago that there would be no need for any author to repeat that story has been done, or you could say it proves that. Dogs are so tender and so full of love that their death is the worst thing that an author can do. So that story can go either way, but you have to judge it now. So I'll put the topic and I'll ask you to cheer on the affirmative if, that, if you believe that Solari and Sue have won. The author, authors should not kill the dog. Who believes that's correct? You should not kill the dog. Who believes the negative one that it's okay to kill the dog? Yeah, I give it to the negative. Sue, Sue needs a word. Thank you so much, Richard, and you're all wrong. <laughs> <laughs>